All right. Hey, um, hello, everyone. Um, I don't know why it's just my face on there. Clearly, we have more than just me speaking. So it's apologize okay, to our it's speakers all right. for not having your faces on this gigantic screen. Um, okay. So before we get started, um, just a little backstory about this panel and um, my relationship with everyone on this panel. So before joining ENS Labs, I served for a year on the ENS DAO alongside these lovely folks. I had the chance to work with each and every one of them. Um, and actually being on the DAO side was what sort of ENS pilled me into wanting to join labs. Um, and one of the things that I really thought was really amazing was how much respect labs had, not labs, ENS and decentralized governance to me was like actually a successful implementation. I think we talk about governance a lot in this space. Um, and there's not, not a lot of really healthy re relationships between like, uh, whether it's like DAO, individual members of the DAO, delegates, but in my experience working with these folks, working in the DAO environment was, was nothing but positive. So I'm really, really excited to be on here with my former DAO colleagues. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna pass it over. I'm gonna start with Slobo. Tell me about you. Tell me about your working group, um, what you guys focus on, what your role is, and uh, how long you've been involved with the ENS DAO. Sure thing. Uh, well, thank you, Catherine. And so I'm Slobo, Slobo.eth. Uh, this is Earl, which is my support animal. Um, I lead the ecosystem working group, which is responsible for uh, making sure that developers and the ecosystem is well taken care of. Uh, we have initiatives to provide grant funding. We support hackathons in collaboration with um, ENS Labs that staffs them. And we do a bunch of other like kind of innovative programs, but I don't want to hog too much uh, time and I want to pass along to uh, my colleagues. Um, I'm Simona. Simona.eth. Um, and how long have I been in the DAO for? I feel like three years since the beginning. Um, I started off as MetaGov steward in the very first term. And then for the past two terms, I've been in the public goods working group. Um, we, as the name says, we focus on funding public goods, um, not just ENS related, but any public goods in this ecosystem. Um, and in this term, together with um, my fellow stewards, Eduardo and Coltrane, um, we have um, funded well over a million in public goods funding, which has, you know, oh, are we doing like a little brief thing on what we've done this year? Or I'm um, just, that's the next question. Okay. Just front running there. Um, but yes, we've done all that. And I will talk more in a second about that. All right. Thank you. My name is Spence, Spence.eth. Um, and I'm going to go off script real quick. These events are really hard to put on. Um, I know there's not a lot of people in here, but can we get a quick round of applause for everybody at Labs who's worked their butt off to make this happen? I know right, right there, I know Aaron in the middle of the room, Ernie.eth has done a ton of work. These characters right here, I think, came from her mind. Oh. Sorry, everybody. Uh, you have to talk about yourself now. Thank you. oh, yeah. now, now about me. Okay, sorry. I can't help it. I like to thank AV guys too. No. Um, so I am the lead steward of the Meta Governance Working Group. And contrary to maybe its name, Meta Governance does not actually govern anything. But we do serve the DAO. We, we try to facilitate and make sure that governance happens in the right way, the way it's supposed to, that we follow the rules, that everyone's aware of how to make proposals, that we take care of the funds as well as we can, and just help make sure and facilitate the other working group's ability and their ability to, to serve the protocol, which is really, I think, the goal of the DAO in general, which is just to ensure the protocol is here for a long time, for as long as everyone in here is, has reserved their name, right? Everyone, everyone in here has a name. If you have a name reserved for more than five years, raise your hand. Oh, okay, that's a lot. Ten. All right. All right. Fifty. Who has the longest? We got one guy in here with fifty years. That's a long time. So anyway, the DAO needs ENS needs to be around. The protocol needs to be around for all of those years that we have reserved names for, and that's one of the things I think that the DAO is responsible for, just making sure the, the protocol is pro protected, has longevity, and it's stable. Yeah. So as you can tell, the ENS DAO is made out of three groups, um, and each of these seats are publicly elected by token holders. Some of you may have actually even voted for uh, the folks in these seats. Um, 
So give me a glimpse into, you know, now that we're November of 2024, give me a glimpse um, on how 2024 has gone for your working group and any cool initiatives or things that you want to highlight. Sure thing. Uh, so for ecosystem, I think the most important thing is how many hackers interacted with ENS at uh, the various hackathons. So we've had over 300, um, and we've done, I think, six uh, hackathons, uh, mostly with ETH Global, but also with ETH Rome, and the other one is now escaping me. But uh, So that's been really cool. The other thing that's been a super interesting initiative that we haven't done before is work with DRIPS. And DRIPS, who aren't familiar, is allows you to do public goods funding to a uh, GitHub repository. And what we did is we actually funded something like GraphQL, which is utilized by ENS. And because we did that, even though it's a traditional Web2 company, I'm sorry, Web2 uh, repo, uh, the maintainer of that was onboarded to Web3. And there was actually several other people who did that, and that's been incredibly exciting for me because it's using uh, ENS's funds to bring more people, especially highly talented developers, into effectively the ecosystem, or at least crypto to start. And uh, I love how there's this attitude of giving back to the things that ENS is built on, and people don't think about open source software because it just kind of works. Um, so those are the two things I'm most proud of, which is the number of hackers we funded and the fact that uh, we onboarded some maintainers of public repos onto ENS. Awesome. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, so with uh, the Public Goods Working Group, um, we obviously, again, <laughs> as it says on the tin, um, we very much focus on um, public goods, not just funding public goods at large in this ecosystem, but also furthering the conversation around public goods. Public goods has traditionally been like this area that a lot of people talk about, and then when it comes to action, there's um, not necessarily that much cash that makes it towards public goods. And so the incentives around building public goods haven't traditionally been there. We remember that ENS is a public good, right? And so this tradition of continuing funding public goods is something that is very, very close to the mandate or like is the mandate of this working group. And what we've done in this year is really trying to streamline and maximize that impact in as many ways as we can. So more than talking about public goods and what it means, more than talking to builders at many events this year and um, supporting hackathons and some community events throughout the world so far, we are also just launching and just launched today, it's gone live, a partnership with Build Guild, uh, you guys will be familiar with Build Guild. They are builders who have been building for builders since the very beginning and for a very long time. And we launched this builder grants platform that is live today. Um, there's going to be a tweet um, coming from Yannis and so on. But the idea with that is to streamline all of these public goods grants at all stages of the build journey. Whether you need a small amount of funding all the way through to large grants. This platform is designed to take you through all of those stages of building a public goods. Builders are public goods, what they can build, is something very, very important, and we want to continue supporting them in as seamless of a way um, as possible. So um, that's kind of, I feel, the culmination of 2024 for us. So yeah, exciting. Awesome, great work. Okay. Um, meta governance, uh, term five. Um, there's several things we've done. I think we've done some um, good moves with the endowment to make it perpetual and self-funding, which I think is really key. Um, some good streamlining there. Uh, we had some great uh, initiatives around both what was called the veto contract and then more importantly the Security Council, which came from some research from Blockful. Specifically, I don't know if anybody from Blockful is in the room, but Blockful, there we go, at least one, a couple of hands, did some great research. And not only did they do the research, but they actually took action. And they proposed some things that allowed us to put a, a safety net, if you will, behind the proposal mechanism. Not perfect and ideal in a DAO sense, but there was some research around some, you know, some, some differential between the value of the treasury and delegated votes, and we needed it. And, you know, Blockful took action there, so that was a, that was a big key thing. 
I think also, um, you know, just making sure that the, the working groups are working well. Um, ideally, if meta-governance is doing its job and doing its job well, you'll, you'll hear less about it, I think is, is really the goal there, but um, yeah. Yeah, um, well, that's awesome. A lot of, um, a lot of achievements just in the, in the last 11 months from all of you. Um, so turning it, I guess, a little bit more just on the topic of decentralized governance in general. So I believe all of you are or have been involved with other, other DAOs, other ecosystems. Um, and of course, there's no one DAO that fits all and there's no one DAO that, no two DAOs that run exactly the same. Um, from your perspective, what are some of the things that ENS DAO Sorry, what are some of the things that sets the ENS DAO apart from some of the other DAOs that either you're part of or maybe are just a you know, participant in? Is there something that we do really well or maybe some low lights? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start and I'm curious to see if uh, my colleagues will agree. I think uh, ENS does an excellent job of delegating the right power to the right people and then those people having ultimate discretion. Whereas a lot of DAOs that I've seen, they try to create a lot of process and then they just follow that process religiously. And that's, that has like pros and cons. And I think ENS really lets, it empowers Metagov, public goods and ecosystem to do what those people are, right? And the check on our kind of power is the fact that we have to have an election. So, and to me, I think it's great because uh, it's really important to me that the best people are always in the best roles. And I think other uh, DAOs are kind of focused more on process rather than actually like the end goal, which is making sure that the right people are in the right places. So that's my view. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think um, I tweeted once that the most important thing in DAOs, well, actually, it's, it's a, the balance between attention and action. And I think to Slobo's point, it is that balance between having a very good process because you do need process, right? Let's, figure, let's be very realistic. Most people have no idea how to collaborate in a completely decentralized space. We're just not, for generations, we're not prepped for that. So a lot of it is a process of learning and process is important. But that balance of making sure that you have the right people with the right context Context is a massive thing when it comes to governance and the ability to gain enough context to make sure that you facilitate and then enforce the right or make the right decisions is key. Sometimes there is a tendency to switch a lot of perspectives very quickly, which is valuable because you do want fresh perspective. But again, you want that balance of context, like depth, and also innovation. And striking that balance is a key one, which I think to your point, we've managed to do so far. Obviously experimentation can continue and we can figure things out. But I would say that balance and meeting and matching that balance is an important thing to, to be mindful of as we evolve. All right, um, how are we different? Can I start with the obvious one, revenue? Um, which I think changes the landscape across the board. Um, you know, in, in us as a, as, a, as a platform is really not very different than a, a SaaS software company. Um, maybe that's an analogy I draw because it's, it's where I come from. But the unit economics are the exact same in terms of renewals and in, in terms of churn and um, um, new users. But that revenue and then that ability to kind of do what I described earlier, which is make sure the protocol is here for a long time, is different. And in all honesty, I think that this is a model that can bring a lot of the Web2 software companies into Web3, if we look at this as the type of way a subscription software company can function in Web3. Um, but aside from that, um, how are we really different? Uh, you know, I see a lot of negative stuff sometimes on the, on, on, is, is left Eris in here, right? There's people that, that are often constantly talking negatively about DAOs and, um, you know, there are some DAOs out there that I think deserve some very negative criticism. I don't think this is one of them. I think we do a really good job of balancing the right number of, of large delegates to get a good consensus around decisions. Um, people that are stakeholders that care about the protocol, that make decisions in the best interest of the protocol. Um, I don't know quite how we've done that or how we've, we've gotten there, um, but I do think that's different. It's different than what I see in other DAOs. Now, I will say there's a couple of DAOs that I'm a part of, it really just one, that are very small, more pure DAO, right, where there aren't working groups. 
Um, and that is simpler. It's a simpler impl implementation of what a DAO is. It's very difficult to have this human coordination layer in the midst. Um, and I think we do a good job of kind of functioning almost as a living smart contract in terms of the way we, we do things, the rules, the working group rules are what we execute on. And I think that helps us stay, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a place that prevents the human coordination issues from becoming a problem. It keeps us in a way of really serving the DAO and what the DAO is supposed to be, which I think is different. Yeah, let's, let's like zoom out even a little bit more and talk about um, what do you think, again, just like going back to, you know, DAOs were really, really hot in 21. They kind of became not so sexy like in the last two years. And I, I feel like now as more protocols are approaching maturity, the conversation of governance and what the right form factor is, is sort of back on the table. Um, in, in your personal opinion, as you're thinking through decentralized governance and all the structures and all the safeguards uh, that you can put in place to, to set one up, what are the non-negotiables, like the absolute non-negotiables that like a, a, any DAO that calls itself a DAO must have? So you need to have multiple people with voting power. It has to be decentralized and there has to be multiple perspectives. If you only, and I think that's what's another thing that's great about ENS is uh, we don't have a single whale that uh, is, is the main voter. Um, if you kind of look at it, technically there's like a, a voting veto power, but outside of that, you know, the top 10 people, they all have about roughly equal voting power and they're actually not afraid to show it. There are, you know, there are people who have really strong opinions and ENS elicits strong opinions because it's so important. And uh, like many of us, you know, the one, us here and the people in the audience, we often disagree and we disagree in public and it's kind of uncomfortable, but I think in a way that freedom to disagree publicly and the fact that each of those delegates actually has a strong, not only a voice, but also the ability to influence actual actions, that's, that's sick. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll let my colleagues uh, add to that. Do we wanna mix up the order or shall we do? I'll, I'll go, go since you you, you, like you want to think. Right. Um, Non-negotiables. Uh, you know, obviously a part of what we do is executable transactions, transactions that have on the blockchain. There's nothing to negotiate there. But all DAOs have social proposals. Um, and I think a non-negotiable is essentially following those proposals. I think that's what makes a DAO what it is. Again, back to that autonomous nature. We're trying, we're trying to put training wheels on this new structure of doing things that still needs to kind of be cared for, um, to make sure that it gets wings and, and takes off. And so I think the non-negotiables are honoring that. Um, you know, to Alex's point, we don't have a whale. We could. I think, you know, we're still in the early phases, but there are people that probably could, you know, exert an outsized influence in the DAO. But fortunately for us, I think our delegates, our large delegates, honor and intentionally honor that nature of kind of let's have a let's have a group of people with power that um, make decisions that allow for contrarians um, and I don't know that that's necessarily in the non-negotiable camp but um, but but I think honoring the proposals that take place kind of is yeah yeah there's no doubt without, without disagreement <laughs> is basically it sorry and to that point one of the main main things to remember is that DAOs are made up of humans. They have a lot of very, very different ways of interacting, of being able to communicate, of being able to coordinate. Some people don't know, have never had the experience of having to do that. And so if you take that as a baseline reality, there are just some things that you absolutely need to focus on. Accountability is a big one. Uh, the ability to hold a space for discussion is very, very important. And also, really, this ability to have some sort of conflict resolution, whether it is by having those discussions in spaces where that's kind of a value add type of discussion versus a um, we're just anonymous people on a random forum type of discussion is a very different thing. And I think being able to create these spaces that actually not necessarily dictate, but encourage that accountability-based value-add discourse 
should be the baseline of any kind of DAO and also this recognition that we are humans trying to collaborate and what do we need to help us do that and figuring out what the right process is. Maybe it does go through a series of experimentation and that's totally fine. We're not going to figure it out like that because again, a lot of us have no idea how to interact with other people. A lot of people don't know how to communicate non-violently because traditionally we've just been trained generationally in a very different way, in a very competitive very argumentative way. And realizing these things and being able to incorporate those in a very mindful way of creating structures for governance is important. Um, so, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'm trying to think about where to take this. Um, let, let's actually talk about like, um, you know, DAOs, are relatively new concept. Like, I'm sure maybe each one of you had had conversations, maybe with a family or a friend, when you try to describe to them how you work for this thing, right? And you have to run publicly for it, and somehow you're making incredibly important decisions also. I, I think for a lot of my friends and family, it's, it's a very like, what moment? Um, how would you say, like, and, and all of you have also had working experience before coming into the DAO space. Um, what are the biggest, craziest differences between working in a normal corporate structure and working in a DAO? And this could be like anything you want to highlight. So this could be like something you say to a friend or family that you know is going to shock them or something that was shocking to yourself even as you came into the DAO space. Maybe we start with yeah, let's start, yeah, Simona, let's start with you, because I felt like you were onto God something damn. there. Okay. Um, what's the biggest difference? I would say, and I think this applies to every single person who comes into this ecosystem and feels that ability to breathe a sigh of relief of like, fuck, this kind of feels like freedom. And being able to express my opinion and what I feel is right and valuable to me in and around other people who may be value aligned. There's sometimes this like whole thing of going and working a regular job and whatever that you're like, am I like, are we value aligned? Am I value aligned with my colleagues? You may be with one or two. This feels like that alignment is much deeper and much more than surface level. And I think it's that type of, I don't know, enthusiasm, energy that comes out of that, that kind of helps you navigate the frustrations that we have in the fact that we are operating in completely nascent structures that we're kind of like building as we're sailing. It's kind of like building a ship as you're on it and go like, well, quick, so that we can go further. But it is that type of energy and that type of belief that I think is the big thing that continues to propel us forward, that continues to make us be here for another year, even though it's sometimes tiring, even though it's sometimes very frustrating, the fact that we haven't made more headway or that something is still not working as it should be. But hey, you get to put ideas into practice and make them manifest in a much shorter time, in a much less bureaucratic way. Again, there's a lot of things that we still need to work on, but I think it's freedom and it's a breath that we, are, for a lot of us, can take almost like after a, two minutes of holding your breath. That's what it feels like. Mm. Spence, what do you think? Because you currently yeah. work in yeah. both Web 2 and Web 3, right? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Um, I spend most of my time primarily in Web 2. Um, and I can tell you it's very difficult to take someone who does not understand blockchain or crypto, let alone DAOs or anything like that, and get them from zero to what is this. Um, you know, you can take, I've sat down and taken entire meals before, you know, where it's by the, just by the end of the meal, they, someone finally gets it, but they're so there's so much information they have to absorb to get there that, that by the time they get to the revelation, it's, it, it doesn't have the power. Um, but how is it different? Um, you know, I, I won't talk necessarily about the working groups because I kind of think of working groups as sort of something I hope to be a vestigial part of, of, of the future DAO. Like the future DAO can be autonomous without the need for, for this. Um, so it's more about the delegates. Um, 
what's different, right? The delegates do run the DAO. The delegates make the proposals. The delegates decide what happens. It's about the delegates. What is different? Delegates can't be fired, right? No one can fire a delegate. It just, just doesn't happen. It can't happen. That's just the nature of ERC-20 delegation. It just, it just doesn't happen. Very different than any corporate or traditional structure. Um, you know, what does that mean? It means that everyone has to, has, to, has to get along. We have to find a consensus, and it's difficult to do so, but that nature of forcing that, I think, is the value of these structures. Um, you know, uh, so that would be what I'd say is different. Um, the sticking power of the delegates, right? Because a delegate is proof of stake, essentially, right? Because you're delegating this vote. You could be doing something else with this token. You could sell it, but you're not. You're delegating to someone. That is, you're putting your stake, you're putting a value behind this person, you know, um, and that can't be taken away, right? That's part of this whole sovereign thing that we all work in. And so I think that's really just a, the biggest key difference for me, for anybody who's familiar with Web2. Yeah, so kind of mirror this, is there's no one voice. That's, that's the main difference. When you're in any corporation, there's, or like usually there's gonna be a shareholder and that shareholder's gonna nominate a CEO. There's gonna be one clear voice. Here, there are many voices and those voices can change at any moment. Um, that's, that's how I kind of describe it. To some of my friends, I'll say like, oh yeah, I work in a non-for-profit because it's the only way it kind of makes sense even though ENS makes $30 million a year. Um, but so do hospitals, so it, it's okay. Um, and, but I think like having all these different voices um, that come together and actually, I'm gonna use the word divining perspective of the delegates is, is kind of hard because you know, yes, it's easy to say if a delegate or a group of delegates approve a proposal. It's very different because, you know, someone's got to write that proposal. And that process, it's like, it doesn't actually happen in public. It just, ooh, there's a proposal. What do I think of it? Because most delegates have day jobs, multiple obligations. So it's kind of a weird thing is that, like, what you put on is what's the thing that's going to be judged. But... Uh, it, like how that like amorphous uh, structure gets created to the point where it can be solidified into something that is the will of the delegates. Um, that's been just absolutely phenomenal and something that I've never been able to properly articulate to uh, my friends and colleagues because it's like, hmm, this is what it is, you know? And it's like, now we get to vote. Now we know what they think. Yeah. And uh, oftentimes there's surprises. Things don't pass if people have been paying attention. So, uh, and uh, I think that's like, I mean, I'm, I'm laughing because it's kind of funny and also quite painful. Yeah. Yes. Um, so there's a common, maybe, uh, there is the, the common, um, I don't want to say criticism, but I, maybe I'll say uh, there's a take that decentralized governance comes at the cost of efficiency. Do you think that is a feature or do you think that is a bug? Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's either, but it, partially, can I, can I, sorry. Um, but it, it's a necessity, right? There's nothing about decentralizing that is more efficient. There's nothing about decentralizing that is simpler. Everything about decentralizing is harder. It takes more energy. It takes more effort. It takes longer. It takes more coordination but we do it because the outcome is better, right? Um, and it's hard because it's always easier to kind of think, oh, well, we can just make this decision this way, or oh, well, we can just decide to do it this way, because it always is simpler to move away from that decentralization. Um, so I don't, I don't know if the difficulty is a feature or a bug, but, uh, but I think it's absolutely a part of it, and I think being a part of this means that you have to understand and accept that you are, you're, you're undertaking that more difficult task because of the quality of the outcome. Here's a quote that I think Awaki um, mentioned in a conversation, I don't know, 2018, 2019. It's basically like nobody comes home in the, anywhere in the world and goes, ugh, my day was so centralized, that sucked. And it's true, right? Centralization, we have lived with it for so long that we think it's normal. Right? That's just normality. But actually, and I'm going to bring you into biomimicry here, because I like this stuff and the beautiful background of the tree is inspiring me. So, in nature, the balance point is the optimum window of viability. Now, where is that? It's between diversity and full efficiency. 
It is in the middle. It is absolutely not with full efficiency. You know who goes for full efficiency? It's the way we have constructed things and its centralization. But what that does is by removing the level of diversity, it makes a system brittle. If you look at any man-made reforested area, it is all in straight lines. You light a match in one of those things, it will go up like that. You light a match in a jungle that has loads of different layers of vegetation and this with this with this, at some point it will stop because it is resilient. Diversity and diversity of opinion, diversity of doing things is, makes a system resilient. Over-efficiency, and we've seen this with the financial system time and time and time again, it makes a system brittle. Efficiency should be depedestalized Im immediately. Yes, there is some benefit to it and so on, but definitely not to the level that we hold it as like, oh my God, let's be more efficient. Sometimes it's not good. Thank you for that. Um, that okay. I think I'll keep it brief. There's efficiency and there's effectiveness. If I want to get downstairs from uh, the roof, I can jump and not survive, or, and, and that would be very efficient, but that wouldn't really be effective. So if you pull back far enough, the, the goal of decentralized organizations is to be extremely effective at the right time scale. And that's what it comes down to. It's what is your time scale that you're judging things by. Um, and that's why like, if you want to go far, um, Sorry, if, if, if you want to go fast, uh, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And like ultimately, that's, that's what DAOs are about, and like we want to go forever. Yeah. Well done. That, that is, that's a great note to end on. Um, for those of you in the audience who are curious about ENS DAO, check out the forums. Each one of these uh, working groups have open calls every week. They're open to the public. Um, tune in just to hear about what these... What, what they're up to, and uh, hope to see any of you who are down curious in the forums and in, in our calls. And with that, thank you so much to our lead stewards for imparting so much Dow wisdom today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Catherine, yes, for moderating you. the panel.